So let's go ahead and uh, just go over to email templates. Just let's go ahead and navigate over there so everyone can see where it's at. So if you go under the hammer icon and then go under templates, you can have your email templates here. Uh, the first email template I'm going to start with just to give you an idea of something I have set up. Um, this is one of my old accounts. Uh, let's see here. Accepted offer. And let's go into my accepted offer buyer. So first thing I want to touch on is how email templates are set up. So at the top, you have your template name here. You also have to this is who this is going to. So this is going to go to my buyer. Now, the way that I set these up, it doesn't matter if you have one buyer or 50 buyers, it's going to go to all of the people listed as buyer under your contact screen. So uh, over here, we have two buyers, we have Rick and Morty. Uh, they are going to be the buyers, so they're going to get this email. If I have any other buyers or if I had a buyer halfway through, they're also going to get this email. Okay, so one thing that I like to do uh, that's a little bit different um, from most is I like to have a CC, and I do a CC on all buyer emails, CC on all buyer side transaction emails. This is helpful for if you have a mom and a dad helping a son buy a house. Uh, they're not on the contract, but they want copied on every single um, email that goes out to that buyer. This is an easy way to add them in the contacts to, let's see if I have one. Well, I have a BCC, but I could change this to a CC. So CC on all buyer emails. And now everything that goes out for that buyer is also going to go out to everyone on this label. You can also do CC on all buyer side transaction emails. This is helpful for when you're training someone, uh, maybe a new TC, maybe a new agent. You want to give them a feel for how the transaction flows. You can put them on a BCC. Actually, I'd probably do a BCC instead of a CC so everyone sees them. Um, but this is great for training purposes. Same thing with BCC. I do the same thing on all of mine, BCC on all buyer emails. Also helpful for if you're in an escrow state, the escrow officer says, I have five assistants that you need to copy on everything, then this would be to the escrow officer. The CC would be CC on all escrow emails and you can put all five assistants on there. You never have to remember for the rest of the transaction that you have to copy those people. Now, you can do it with lenders too, lender assistants, lender processors, people like that. You can also do it in an attorney state if they have paralegals working on the file or something like that. You can, you can kind of tie it all up so you don't have to remember things throughout the transaction. Okay, so that is the contacts. Um, I always put accepted offer on my accepted offer emails and then the contract title, which is the full address. So contract titles, the full address, including zip code. Uh, property address is just going to be like 123 Main Street. Uh, okay, so let's start in the body here. In the body of the email, I have congratulations. The contract was accepted by all parties on. And then I have a merge field here. The merge field is the contract delivery date. So in Arizona, the delivery date holds over the actual signing date. So if I if everyone signs it on Tuesday and I don't receive it till Wednesday, then the delivery date is actually going to be the day that we calculate our dates off of in Arizona. Yours is probably different. So you can adjust as necessary. Now, I also have a smart block in here. And we're going to go over smart blocks in a little bit here, but I have a smart block for if the delivery date is different from the contract date. A lot of agents in our state don't know that rule. So I have a little blurb in here, a little couple sentences just to explain that, hey, the delivery date was different from the contract date. We're, we're gonna calculate the dates from the delivery date just to get everyone on the same page right up front. And there's no, you know, get halfway through the transaction and have these issues. So second paragraph, I wanna take a, a minute to introduce myself. My name is buyer transaction coordinator, full name. I'm the transaction coordinator for this agent. I have a smart block here to dump in the co-agent if there's a co-agent on the file. Um, just some niceties around here. And then when we get down to this paragraph, uh, we've sent all fully signed documents to your escrow agent. And then there's a smart block here for the words and lender. These are only going to come in if the financing type is not equal to seller financing. It's not equal to cash and the lender exists in the property. Then we're going to go ahead and say, the words and lender. And you'll notice you can't see it here, but there is a space before the word and, and that's because this sentence, uh, the period is right up against this escrow agent. And so if I insert something here, I'm gonna have to have a space before the and or else it's gonna say agent and all in one word. So just make sure you pay attention to that formatting as you go through. Um, so this is gonna say escrow agent and lender, and then it'll pop that period. It'll just push it out to the end of this smart block to the words and lender period. Um, and then we come down here. Now you can do bullet points. You can do you can do a lot of different things. The thing that you don't want to do is a lot of stylizing, um, if possible. I leave everything in the template format, Arial. Um, and then we do bold, we do highlights, we do red a little bit, uh, but we don't get over excessive on it. 
The one thing that can screw up your smart blocks is if you try to stylize the actual double curly brackets, smart block name, double curly brackets. When you start stylizing this, the back end of the system doesn't understand what you're trying to do. And sometimes it will miss us popping in a smart block. So when, if at all possible, keep all the formatting off of your email and do very minimal formatting. Also, when you bring in new emails, if you're copying and pasting from another system, you're going to want to clean them. So you can come up here to the text cleaner, clean those, and then reformat those in our system so that they work properly. 99.9% .9 of the people that say their smart blocks aren't working right is because they copied from Microsoft or some other program and tried to paste them in here without uh, cleaning the text. So just a little note there. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to come back in here and do smart blocks and merge fields in a second here. I just kind of want to give you a little primer on that. Um, down here at the bottom, you have your contact roles. So, or I'm sorry, your file roles. So your file roles are how to tell the system what this document is. So if it's an addendum, I need to tell it it's an addendum. If it's a counter offer, I need to tell it it's a counter offer. If it's a contract, same thing. So these are all the possible things that could come into this email. Now, as a reminder, this is to my buyer. This is an accepted offer buyer email. So this is congratulations, you went under contract. Here are all the documents for your records. Now, these are automatically going to attach if they exist in your documents tab in the transaction. So what I do is typically 99% of our contracts only have four or less counter offers. So I only put four in here. My TCs know if there's a fifth one or a sixth one that they're going to have to add those manually. Um, that rarely, rarely happens. Um, and then sometimes there's an addendum. A lot of agents write their contracts wrong and they put an addendum in this first part, which we shouldn't. We should put it all in the counter offer, but it's in there as kind of a fail safe. Uh, I have the contract here. Now, I, when I do the contracts, when I put in my file rules, I put suffix on them. So I put BS for buyer sign, SS for seller sign, FE for fully executed, AS for agent sign, LS for lender sign. You know, I have a whole gamut of those. And this keeps it very organized because when I send these automated emails or task triggers or property triggers or intake triggers, all these different things, I want to know exactly what that document is. So if I download into the system something with a BS for buyer signed, I may have it automatically attached to an email going back out to the seller to tell the seller, hey, we signed it, now it's your turn. If it's a seller sign in reverse order, I may send it to the buyer, we signed it, now it's your turn. If it's fully executed, it's more of, hey, this is the fully executed agreement that you want to keep for your records. So I want to know in each email which one I'm attaching here. And that's why I think it's a lot easier to add this suffix onto your file roll. So. Okay, so you have some options here. When you attach it, you can attach all of them that match the file roll. You can do the newest, you can do the oldest. You'll select your file roll. You'll see I have a lot of file rolls in here. I basically went down through a zip form at the time was our program that we use. Now it's Transaction Desk. And so I went down basically every document that could possibly come into a residential transaction and then a commercial and then land and went through all those and put all those documents in here with these iterations. Uh, BCA buyer sign, this is our buyer contingency addendum. The reason I put this in parentheses is if you have a new person and they don't know your nomenclature yet and they wanna search for something and they type in buyer, I want that buyer contingency to pop up. Uh, BCA isn't gonna work. If they don't know your nomenclature, they're never gonna be able to find this stuff without scrolling through a million documents. So I do BB for buyer broker, BCA for buyer contingency. There's a, there's a number of, um, a number of abbreviations we do on our team to keep it concise. But in here in the file rules, I want to do the full name too, so that people can search for it and find it. Um, so you can see fully executed buyer sign, seller sign, unsigned for US. Um, so I have iterations of all these different documents. So I know exactly what it is and how it's going to come in. Now, once you choose your file role, you're also going to, this is a new update that happened yesterday with documents. We have main files, and then we also have additional files under that main file. So you have to specify, do you want any file that matches or just the main file. So pay attention to this. This is going to default to the main file just because that's the way it was in the system before, but now you have choices. So we added this if you need to go back and change anything. Okay. So basically what these file roles are doing is they're going over to the document section. They're looking for this document. They're looking for this file role that you attach to that document. And if that file role exists, it's going to automatically attach that document to this email. So it makes it very efficient. You're not sitting there after the email comes in attaching documents. You already know 90% of the time what documents are going to be attached to that email. If you need to send a one-off, no problem. You just hit um, add an attachment and add it onto that. 
Okay, so let's go back up into, um, I, actually, you know what, I want to mention one more thing in the body. A lot of people put high buyer first name or high escrow officer, buyer, uh, seller. I try to avoid that at all costs. It, it causes a lot of complications. The system does handle it well. So if you put high buyer first name and you have 15 buyers in here, it's going to say, hi, John, Jack you know, Jim and Sally, it'll, it'll make it grammatically correct. The problem comes in when you're trying to do buyer first name, escrow officer first name, seller first name, it's not going to handle it well unless you get really, really creative. So a lot of my emails, you'll notice I just say hi and then go right into the email or congratulations and go right into the email. I'm not addressing them by first name. If you feel like you have to address them by first name, by all means, figure it out, um, put the buyer first name in there. But just be careful and make sure you're testing these before they go out so that it doesn't, the formatting isn't all jacked up when you send it to your buyer and then, you know, it doesn't look good. Okay. So that's one of the things I wanted to mention. Um, let's go to, uh, let's just look at the merge fields for a second. So let's go under here to the merge fields and pop up your merge field menu. When you click on something, it's going to copy it. So you'll see that was copied here. And if I wanted to come in this email and paste it in, I can paste that in. Uh, I wouldn't bold it because that's a merge field or a smart block. So, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, merge fields, you can bold if you want them to end up bolded. But smart blocks don't, um, again, don't format the actual curly bracket name, curly bracket, curly bracket. So, um, okay, so here are all your merge fields. You can go in and add a brand new field right now, and it will appear here instantly. So uh, very flexible as far as new fields and how they come into emails. Uh, you have contact roles. So under each of these contact roles, you're going to have a bunch of different things. You have their full name. You have their full name, including middle name. You, you can go through all these different options, but you have a lot of them there. Here are your smart blocks. If you want to bring in smart blocks manually um, or when you're setting it up, you can just click on that. It's going to copy it and you can paste it over here. We're going to get more into that later. And then you have your smart block groups. Uh, utilities. So utilities is really important. And we're going to get into contact loops in a bit. Um, but this is a way, if you have 16 buyers, to have them all listed in order uh, down the page. So if I want to list all the home inspectors that I'm recommending, and there's 15 of them, well, I'm going to do a contact loop on that. And that way, all 15 of them come in in a line. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. And then the BR, this is for a break. So if I wanted to have a space here, I can put that in there and it's going to put a break line in between. Keep that in mind. And then property email address as well. So that's the property email address that you can email documents into, and then they're going to come in automatically to the back end of the system. And uh, there'll be unapproved documents, and then your TC will be able to approve them and then get them into uh, the transaction. And then there's also the me. So this is uh, my cell phone, my email, my first name, all that kind of stuff. So this is really the important one. Uh, and we're going to go a little bit more in detail on this, but contact loops and the break lines are very important to remember as you're setting this up. Okay. Um, let's go to uh, smart blocks. Let's talk about smart blocks a little bit. Let me go over. I think it's... There we go. So here are all my smart blocks. So there's different types of smart blocks. There's ones with text in them. So this is going to say, this is a space here. You can see there's a space before, like I mentioned earlier. And buyer agent, um, buyer co-agent full name. So this is going to be, if there's a co-agent on the file, I'm going to bring in, uh, you know, I'm rep or, you know, I'm transaction coordinating for Mark and Jim. And then the period's already in that sentence. So that will come at the end of that. So there's text. And then what we like to do on our team, and I apologize, we're on um, Zoom, so it's going to take a little longer to go in between these. Okay, I make information ones for my contacts, and these are really important. So here's where the contact loop comes in. So if I come over to, uh, let's see here, Control A pops open my uh, merge field menu, Control S pops open my smart block menu. If I come over here and I want to create a contact loop, I can click on contact loop, and then I can come into, and let's just pretend this top part isn't in here already. It's going to show you, it's going to paste this in. And this is what it's going to look like when it's done. So you want to start and you want to end to that contact. So in my case, I want to label that person. So I'm going to put appraiser. I make that bold. It's okay to put um, formatting inside of the smart block. You just don't want it on the outside of the smart block label. So I went ahead and bolded appraiser. And now it's going to start my loop. It's going to look in my contacts and see how many appraisers are in there. So this is a bad example, but if there were 16 appraisers, 
it's going to say list the first appraiser's full name, then list their email, then list their cell phone, then list their business name, then list their phone, then list their business email. And it's going to go down through this whole procession. Then it's going to put a break line. So it's going to be a blank line before it goes back up and loops through the next appraiser. So this would be, this would probably be a better use case for a buyer. There's, you know, four buyers. It's going to loop through the first one, put all that information, put a space, and then it's going to put the second one's information. Then it's going to put the third one, then the fourth one with spaces in between each one. So these are really important. Uh, I'll show you how you use these in a little bit. Um, but I have some smart blocks and things like that to go out to my escrow officers, my lenders, people like that. Um, giving a list of everyone in the transaction, how to contact them. So that's where these come in. Once you set this up, you don't have to come in here and do these merge fields every single time. Now you have a smart block name appraiser information, and all you have to do is paste that in your email, and it's going to loop through these and put all this information in without having to do every single merge field every single time in every email. So that's why it's so important. Down at the bottom here, you have conditions. So I only want the appraiser information to pop in if the appraiser exists in the property. So I don't want a bunch of blank spaces if the, if the appraiser doesn't exist. So this is my condition. If the appraiser exists, go ahead and pop in these things. And if I type in information, you can see that I did this for all my main contacts that I use on a regular basis, appraiser, attorney, buyer, buyer party of the transaction. This is something specific to our team that we use. Uh, buyer's agent, buyer co-agent, you can see all the information ones. So every single contact that I typically use, I'll go ahead and make an information line for it because I don't want to have to go through and do this on a manual basis when I'm creating these. Okay. So let's take a look at uh, these options here. So this is to turn on the smart block. And then this one is going to be in line. So let me pop back over to the email here. Or actually, let me pop over to this one. And so I'm going to mark if it's in line. So this one, I want it to be in this sentence, right? So my name is, oh, I'm sorry, that's not a smart block. Let me go down to this one. So this one, for example, I want this to be in the same sentence as this. So this is going to be an in line. So if I go back over and look at my uh, accepted offer buyer co-agent, it's going to be marked in line because I don't want it to go to a new line when the smart block comes in. If I don't have that check, this is going to pop down to the next line. So anything that's like in a sentence, you're going to want to mark in line. If I come over to my uh, smart blocks, that was uh, buyer co-agent. Uh, no, that wasn't buyer co-agent information. That was, let me find it here. Oh, sorry. I have information up here. That's why I wasn't seeing it. Okay. Accepted offer, um, buyer co-agent and co-agent first name. So you can see that was marked in line so that it comes right into that sentence. Okay, that was kind of a lot we covered there. I'm gonna go back over this, but any questions, Shane or Matthew, that I need to answer at this point? No, I think we're good. We just have people asking about whether or not this is part of TC workflow. Uh, no, almost everything we're gonna cover in this webinar has nothing to do with TC workflow. Uh, open and close is a completely different um, program than TC workflow. So just keep that in mind. This is not covering anything inside of TC workflow. Cool. Okay, so if you want to add a new smart block, if you have an idea of something you want to add, you can uh, type in the smart block name. And then this is going to be the merge field. So the merge field, you can see the example here. It, let's just say it's um, you can just copy this and you can paste it down here and it's going to make it correct. It's going to take that uppercase A out of there. It's going to put underscores in between the words. This is the format you need before you add it. So let me go ahead and add this. And it's going to open it up. And now I can go ahead and um, do whatever I need to do inside of here. Let me close that out. Let me close it out. Okay. So let's go through an example a little bit more in detail now. And I'll show you some of these. I am going to go ahead and apply. Um, let me close this. And we'll go over to the email. So let me go to the buyer email first. Okay, so here's my buyer email. We're gonna come down here. And now to be able to see these, if you wanted to see one of these smart blocks, all you have to do is double click on this and then hit the smart block so you're not having to bounce back and forth between the screens. This SB is for smart block. So if I open this up, you can see exactly what the smart block is and what the conditions are. So if the financing type is not equal to seller financing or cash, 
I want to go ahead and insert my smart block about contacting your lender. So contact your lender for loan instructions. It gives them a little blurb about what they need to do. This only comes in. So if it's cash, this isn't going to come in. It's going to strip this three out and it's going to make this one, two. And then this is now going to be number three. So let me show you an example of that. Um, let's see here. One, two, three, four. So there's four in there. Let me go over to the actual emails. So Andrew, one thing that um, maybe isn't clear on this, smart blocks are, so uh, Tammy's asking, having a difficult time following, do you create a smart block first or, or separate, or do you create the, or do you create it in the email? So the answer to that is uh, go, you have templates, you have email templates. And so your email templates can be just plain words inside of the template. So go over a template really quick. Yeah. Um, so just click on any of those. So imagine, see. imagine this template just says "Hello World" on it. There's no text in there. You can have email templates that are as simple as just like plain text with no merge fields or anything. On that first line there, he's got a merge field which is contract delivery date, which that is a field inside of the system that will inject that field value from a contract inside of here. Now, smart blocks are a completely separate entity as well. So, smart block delivery date different than contract date that is a block that you use that you create outside of the email that you can inject inside of here anytime you see a double bracket those are merge fields or smart blocks they're really the same thing they're just dynamic conditionals that say inject something from the contract into here now the difference between a contract delivery date merge field which is pulling a value from the contract the smart block is pulling all the content from the smart block, which may be pulling content from the contract and injecting it in the smart block, which then injects it into the email. So smart blocks just have a secondary level of dynamic conditionals related to them that allow you to build whatever it is that you want around that smart block and jam a bunch of content into the email that you couldn't get simply off of a merge field. So hopefully that makes sense. Let me do this. This may um, explain it a little bit better. I'm going to go in and just create a new uh, email template, a very basic one. And I'm going to send this to my buyer. I'm sorry. I'm going to put a subject line in here. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm just going to paste those first two lines to make it really simple. So we're not focused. On, I know my first one is kind of intense. So let's just make it really simple. Congratulations. The contract was accepted by all parties on this date. And this is the smart block. I'm not even going to attach any uh, file rules at this time. We're just going to make this. This is going to be it. So this is called test. Now we're going to go into an actual transaction. Um, let me go over to, okay, this is an actual transaction. And I'm going to apply this template called test. Okay, two of them, but I think it was a capital. Okay. So what came in here was congratulations, the contract was accepted by all parties on. Here was the contract date. So if we scroll down here, you can see the delivery date and the acceptance date are the same. So it didn't put that smart block in there because one of my conditions on that smart block was these two dates have to be different for that extra smart block to pop in. Now, if I change this, and let me change this to the 21st, and update that. Now that's my condition. If these are different, it needs to pop in those extra couple sentences. So let me reapply that template. Now you notice that smart block came in because these dates are different, which was my condition. Congratulations, party was accepted on 921 because that's my delivery date. Please note the contract was signed on all, by all parties on the 20th, but not delivered till the 21st. The contract acceptance date for calculating time periods is 21st. So that's that extra smart block that we put in. So hopefully, hopefully that makes a little bit more sense now. All right. Let me go over to my accepted offer buyer again, because that's kind of a... a very so Andrew, go, go, go to that smart block really quick. Just hit uh, control S or sure. open up that panel. Yeah. Um, go to that smart block that you were just editing. Yeah, the uh, contract delivery. Let's see. Yeah, let me type in delivery. There it is. So somebody was asking, how did that bolding come in? So the smart block, smart block is like a template 
that you can embed in that you can inject into a template. So all the formatting that comes off of a smart block carries over into the parent template that you're injecting it into. And, and the reason that smart block popped in after I changed the date was because if the contract acceptance date is not equal to the contract delivery date, which I changed it, and that's why it came in the second time and not the first time. So if I change this back, it would know that these two are equal. So don't put this wording into that email. And that's the power of smart blocks. Now you can have one email that covers 50 different scenarios versus one email for each scenario, like in most systems. Yeah, as you can see here, inside of this smart block, he's got all of those merge fields as well. So you can have inside of a smart block, you can have another smart block that may contain you contain completely different information that can be injected into this one. And then this smart block can be injected into the email. So it's all it it all just cascades together. You're just adding dynamic information into it so that at the end it renders out that email with everything fully rendered out for you. Yes. So um, I'm not going to get into it today. I may get into it today, actually, a little bit, because I'll show you my buyer, um, my buyer template here. Oops. And let's go into this buyer one, and I'll see if I have a smart block inside of a smart block inside here. So um, coming down here, here are the ones I kind of wanted to show you. So the smart block accepted offer deposit your earnest money. So this one, um, let me go over to my smart blocks here and just show you this preview real quick. Actually, we'll just do schedule inspection since it's right here. All, all my accepted offer ones, I put accepted offer beforehand. So I know that these are the ones that are in those. You can come up with whatever naming convention you want, but I would definitely think about it before you start creating smart blocks. If there's certain ones you're going to have to access over and over again, you're going to want to have some kind of either number code or like I put accepted offer before this to know that these are in my accepted offer emails. Something to, because these can get very, um, you know, as you see, I have hundreds of smart blocks in here. So they are in alphabetical order, but you may want to come up with some type of naming convention. So um, accepted offer, uh, deposit your earnest money. That was the one we were on the other one on the uh, accepted offer buyer email. Now this is a bullet point in my email. I have a bullet point number one, and then I have this smart block. So it can handle bullet points. It'll strip out the number on the bullet point if it's not true. Um, please deposit your earnest money with uh, escrow agent business name. So this may be like Fidelity title, Chicago title, whatever. Uh, here, there's another smart block inside of this smart block with the earnest money due date. So let me pop over to that real quick and show you what that is. Due date. So I can have this smart block inside of another smart block. And that would say your earnest money is due by, and it's going to pull that merge field for the earnest money due date. So you can see that I do have a couple with smart blocks inside of smart blocks. But let's go back over to that uh, deposit your earnest money one again. Okay, so deposit your earnest money with fidelity title. Here's the due date is this. This is that smart block for the escrow agent information that I showed you the loops. If for some odd reason there was two escrow agents, they would be listed here. Just one on top, one on the bottom. If this said buyer agent information, there was four buyer agents, it would list four of them. So you can see how those um, information loops become very important because now I don't have to go and create all these merge fields every single time. I just pop in the smart block and I'm good to go. Whether there's one escrow agent or 50, it doesn't matter. It's going to take care of it for me. Okay, ways to get earnest money over to title drop it off, wire it, or, and then we have another merge field in here. We'll put the escrow agent's first name, can arrange for a courier to pick it up. So now you're giving them this information on how to get it over there, but I don't always want to give it to them because if I already have the earnest money receipt, they've already delivered that. I don't want to look like I don't know what's going on with my own transaction. So I put in here, if the earnest money receipt received is blank still, then go ahead and tell them how to get it over. If it's not blank, which means there's a document downloaded with that file roll on it, 
Oh, I'm sorry. This is actually a field that we do, but you can do file rolls and you can do contact rolls as well. So if the earnest money receipt received is um, yes, then it's not going to pop this in. If it's still blank, it's going to go ahead and pop this in and tell them how to get that earnest money over. All right. So let me go back to my, back to my example now email. And so you can see that was number one of my bullet points. Number two is going to be um, accepted offer, order the inspection. So this is like, hey, if you don't have an inspector you trust, here's our recommendations. And we actually have recommendations that list in there with that smart block of home inspection people that we are recommending. Here's one for the lender. Uh, you know, the mortgage application must be completed within three days. Here's a bunch of other information that they need. This is only going to come in if it's not equal to cash or seller financing. And then number four, this is really important. Uh, we always put this on here about homeowners insurance. We never, we always want them to get a quote during the inspection period, just in case it comes out $4,000 instead of $400 a year, whatever the case may be. Um, but this agent recommendation, this is really important. You can use this with inspectors or plumbers or whatever you're recommending to people. And if when they're filling out the intake form, the agent's filling out the intake form or the transaction coordinator's filling out the intake form, they can put all the people that they want to recommend. This isn't the inspector that actually did the job. These are the recommendations up front. So let's say this agent likes to have five recommendations. As long as they go over and submit these, so in this case, I have Bob Vila. He's one of my home inspectors I'm going to recommend. And I have Ty Pennington. He's my other one that I'm going to recommend. So in this case, it's two. Now, when I go over to, oops, sorry, I forget what tab I'm on. Um, when I go over here, what it's going to do is because I have two recommendations in here, it's going to list their full information twice. And I'm going to show you that in an example here. We're going to go over to an actual email template. And I'm going to go ahead and paste this in. Let me go over to my transaction here. And there it is. So now it took out number one because that wasn't the case. We already had it delivered. So number one's out of there. So it renumbered them. This one was the home inspection. Order your home inspection, any other inspections. This is not required, but we highly recommend it. You have a 10 day inspection period. Your inspection period begins on this was a merge field. Please feel free to choose any inspection company you wish. Blows a recommendation for a home inspector from, and this is the buyer agent's name, uh, Mayor Adam. So under here, it's going to list Bob Vila. I don't have a break line, obviously, in my uh, smart block. I should. I'll go back and change that so that there's a space in between Bob Vila and Ty Pennington. And so it's just listing their information right down. And then it goes into right to the rest of the smart block there. So you can see how that's um, an advantage, especially if you have 50 agents on your team or say you're a TC company, you're working with 500 different agents and they all have different recommendations, all you have to do is create one template email with that smart with that smart block in it for the recommendation. And now whoever they recommend on that intake form is going to pop in automatically so you're not messing around with, hey, if you guys want a recommendation, put it on the intake form, it'll automatically come into your emails and now you don't have to worry about it. So as you can see, this is going to the buyer. So Rick and Morty are the buyers. It's also going to that CC on all buyer emails, which I showed you. So Bob Barker was... Bob Barker was the CC on all, let me scroll up here. So here you go. Bob Barker is the CC on all buyer email. So he was automatically CC'd on this and the two buyers came in on the two line. And then down here, uh, getting quotes on homeowner's insurance, which I just showed you, they did have a homeowner's insurance recommendation over in the contacts and that was Michael Jordan. And so when you come over here, because I have that in the contacts already, it popped in Jumpman Insurance and has all Michael Jordan's information here for them to contact if they need to. All right. So now the last thing I want to touch on before we get into questions is smart groups. Uh, smart groups are a little bit advanced, so definitely get comfortable with smart blocks before you go into smart groups. But smart groups can be very powerful. Um, let me. So if you go over to edit groups, this button right here. It's going to take you to a separate menu and you can stick in. So this is a smart group I have. This is for the escrow agent. When I send over my initial email to the escrow agent, it's going to have a list of all the parties involved in the transaction. Now, I don't need a condition on this because I know there's going to be at least one party in the transaction that I send over to that escrow agent. So there's always going to be a buyer or a seller at the least. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to say 
it has to be something for this to pop in. It's always going to pop in. So below is a list of all parties involved in the transaction. And then this smart block already has a condition on it. So if the buyer exists, then this will pop in because this has the condition on it. If I pop over to the smart block buyer information, there's a condition down here that says if buyer exists, pop that buyer's information or those 10 buyers information into this email. And then I have one for an unrepresented seller, just in case that would ever happen. I have the seller, I have an unrepresented buyer, I have you know everyone that I think could come into this transaction. I'm going to go ahead and list here. But each of these individual smart blocks over in my smart block menu will have the actual condition on it. If listing agent exists, pop it in. If listing co-agent exists, pop it in. If listing transaction coordinator exists, go ahead and pop it in. So that's why I don't need any conditions on this smart group. Now I'm going to show you an example of this here shortly here. Let me just go through one more. Okay, so this one does have a, a condition down here. If so, on my intake form, I ask our buyer agents a bunch of questions. Is there an HOA? Is there a well? Is it septic? Is there a lease solar? Is there own solar? Is there a short sale? You know, all these things that could possibly come up and start screwing up your transaction. I want to convey this to my escrow officer that something is going on in this transaction. So we have a question for the transaction coordinator uh, before they approve this transaction that says, were there any special conditions? If if the buyer agent said yes to any of these, they're going to say yes to this question on the approval side. And that's going to trigger this to pop in that escrow email. And then each one of these, so let me just use this as an example. Uh, this home has an HOA. If I go over to my smart blocks, uh, let's go over to blocks. So there's a double layer of conditions. Not only does the TC have to say yes to that question on that smart group, but if there's an HOA, um, let me see which one it was. The escrow agent has an HOA escrow agent. It also has a condition, is the homeowners association is equal to yes. If that's true, it's going to pop in the sentence and it's going to say, this home has an HOA. Please provide us with the HOA demand once received. So these are all the notes that I'm sending over to my escrow agent. Now, in your case, you may not be in an escrow state. You may have other uses for this, but we do. And so let me, let me get in here. So that was this smart block that pops in if an, if an HOA exists and if the TC said yes to this. Here's one for water well. It may say, hey, there's a water well on this property. Please order the transfer and let us know as soon as you do. Same for septic, you know, same for lease solar. We have to contact the lease solar people. So there's sentences in here or paragraphs in here for each of these smart blocks so that my escrow agent knows everything up front and they don't have to call me 50 times during the transaction. Now, for me, the advantage is I only have to put in one line in my email and it's going to cover all of these things. So let me go over here and apply this template and show you what I mean now. Hopefully this will all tie it together for you. Okay, so this is accepted for escrow agent. So instead of typing those 50 lines of different things that I had in there, you'll see in my email that I only have two lines for those smart block groups. And I apologize, Zoom is very slow. Okay, so come down here and you can see the special conditions. This one had an HOA, so it popped in. This home has the following special conditions. Um, this home has an HOA, please provide us with the HOA demand once received. Now, if it had septic, it would be listed here. If it had well, it'd be listed here. Now, let me show you the actual template of this. Let me go to accept the offer. Uh, accepted. Escrow agent, I have two of these, I'm not sure. Oh, one's for buyer, one's for seller. Okay, so down here you can see, uh, let's see here, smart block group, here are all the uh, transaction special conditions. So I was able just to put one line in here and it covered all of those items. And then here's the all parties involved in the transaction. Um, so that's in there as well. Okay, let's open it up for questions. I know that's a lot of information. so. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions on how to set these up. Hey, will you do one thing? Will you go into another, go into an email? Uh, sure. Yeah. So we had a, a question here about attaching documents. Um, well, I'm not sure how much further you're going to go down this, but if you go to the bottom of this template. Yeah, let me go in seller because there's less my buyer. There's a lot of options. So it gets a little confusing. Yeah. So uh, not that, but the next next one down where it says attach file role, uh, file storage. No, keep going. Oh, oh, file storage, yes. So if you need to add a global document, say you have a utility list or a recommendation list, you can 
uh, store files over inside of the file storage, which is on the left hand panel over there. And then you can attach those to this uh, email template. And so anytime you generate this email, um, it's going to go ahead and grab whatever uh, document you stored inside of, inside of file storage. Yeah, I don't want to add this, but this is how you do it. You just start typing the document name and then it pulls up and you can see if there's a bunch of them in here. Uh, Pat, the closing, this explains to the buyer, like, you know, on a finance deal, how this deal is going to go. I always attach that to an email like one day after the escrow is deposited. Um, so you could do this for utility forms. You could do this for uh, seller disclosures that they need to fill out by hand. Um, anything that really you're sending to them that they're going to fill out for you that doesn't change, um, go ahead and put those in the file storage and you're able to stick these in your templates as well. Now, if it does change, the cool thing is if you have, you know, all these transactions going on, all you have to do is go over to file storage and you can delete it out and replace it with the new one. And then all future transactions will automatically attach this new document that came in, not the old one. So yeah, huge advantage there. All right, while you guys are formulating some questions, if you have any, let me go over to the seller uh, template so I can show you the difference. So in here, instead of buyer, it's check seller. Same thing on the CC line. I'm going to send it to anyone that is CC on all seller emails or seller um, CC on all seller side transaction emails. Same thing with BCC. It is going to uh, BCC on all seller emails or BCC on all seller side transaction emails. Uh, same concept in here. Um, all this was kind of the same down here is a little bit different the things that we're requesting from them. And so we'll have smart blocks for things that may or may not come into the transaction. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, um, I did have a question on this, is that uh, inside of a smart loop, um, a contact loop, you do not want to put um, merge fields. You want to put contact information only. So you would only inside of a smart loop for a contact use contact information. Don't try and put smart blocks or anything inside of that. It just needs to be contact information. Yeah, good point. Good point. Um, here's a question. Is there one smart block, type, a smart block type that you would recommend starting with? Yeah, I would just, regular text stuff is, it, well, contact loops and regular text, just easy. Here, let me just go over here and let me give you a couple examples and maybe this will help you guys because um, so if I go over to my smart blocks, let me just click on a couple of these and uh, appraisal attached. I'm not even sure what email this could please see the attached appraisal. So if there's an appraiser or if the appraisal is below the purchase price, um, then it's going to it's going to put this wording in here and probably attach it to that specific email. Um, so you can really use these for any situation. It's really how we went about it. Best practice is kind of get your emails in here without smart blocks and have your TCs work the transaction. Anything that they have to go and type in manually after it pops up and says, hey, this is ready to go, and you're like, oh, I need to add this line, that should be a smart block. So let's just pretend that they had to add in the words. Let me come down here and find one. Okay, so this one said appraisal conditions, you know, blah, blah, blah. If I had to go in and type this, then I need to create a smart block for it. And then I need to determine when it comes in, when the appraisal conditions is equal to yes, or appraisal conditions description is not blank. So if these two are true, then I want this to come in. And that's kind of how we did it. We had our TCs just keep a steno pad next to them. Anything that took more than a minute or two or anything that they had to type manually in their emails, they're gonna just write it down on a piece of paper, send it to the ops manager. If you're a one person show, just you know, time block some time at the end of the week and then go down and add these at one time. That way you kind of get in a rhythm. It goes quicker. Uh, that's yeah, that's good stuff. Um, so Lucy asked um, for the contact loop. Does it pull all the contacts in the database? Uh, no, <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, you'd have a lot of contacts on that email. It just pulls contacts from the transaction. So if you have if you have four buyers inside the transaction, it's only going to pull the buyers from that transaction. You can't actually use smart blocks outside of a transaction, even though we do have the global email editor. It will never pull data from anything because it doesn't know what it's looking at. So it's never going to pull data from 
anywhere because it's only looking at transaction specific information. It's very similar to the way the file rules work on an email attachment. It's going over to the documents for that transaction, looking for that document and then attaching it. It's the same thing with this. It's going to this contact list looking for everyone assigned buyer and then popping in their information or looking for everyone assigned home inspector recommended by agent and popping it into that place in that email. All right, let me go back. I'm going to find my screen where I had my um, um, smart blocks there. All right, I'll just pull them up again. And I'll just kind of go through a couple of these while we're waiting for questions. Oh, here's a good one. So uh, Kylie has asked, if the template font sizes are not the same, will it be send out all ski wampy? It's a good word. Um, how do we make sure all of them are the same font style? So number one, we highly recommend that you clean all your content before you know before you paste it in here. So we have that text cleaner, or you can click the TX button on side of the the email. So it's really important to clean that off. We see consistently uh, people migrating, say from Microsoft. Uh, and pasting stuff in here and they never clean off their templates. Well, what happens is Microsoft comes embedded with a ton of fonts and styles that um, really are specific to Microsoft. So you see there on the page where it says font weight bold, we will see hundreds of lines of font styling um, on the templates and it's near impossible for us to clean it off. That's why we do recommend that you copy your text, put it in the text cleaner or use the TX button on side of a email to first normalize everything inside of your email so that you don't have all of this ski wampy text that's sitting inside of your your emails which which uh just kind of lurks behind the scene now the second thing is that once you have that set and i'll be honest with you i really recommend that you guys should choose our, our default font and font size um in the email, the more stylization that you put onto your emails, it makes it harder for our system to know what is to be replaced and what isn't to re be replaced. So if you start adding a bunch of styling and configurations to it, it really messes with our algorithm to know like, oh, you know what, this is a smart block that needs to be replaced in here, but it needs to strip out, say, this list item and, and inject itself in there. If you put a bunch of styling around all that, it breaks our system and we don't know how to read into your HTML code and know what to replace. So the second thing is just really make sure you limit the amount of styling if you're using dynamic conditional such as smart blocks and smart groups. Um, you, you, you can obviously add uh, styling, just don't go overboard with it or else you may break your templates. Yeah. Okay, the third thing is, is that if you're using smart blocks, you really want to limit how much styling you put on the smart block. Because again, the more styling you put on it, it's harder for us to know what is logical HTML and what is just um, stuff that, that we don't know how to parse out. Because I mean, you can get into the editor and you can edit anything you want on, on the templates. Now you want to inside of a smart block, as I said, you want to limit the amount of styling on it. Because the smart block content inherits the styling of the parent template. So if you put like font 95 on here and it's big and blown out, it cannot, the if the child template such as this uh, smart block template has a bunch of styling on it, it will not be overridden by the parent template. So the parent template will always be the, the default. That's why you wanna leave your, your smart block templates just leave them plain text so that it can inherit the, the parent template. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you, you saw, I don't know if it's still up. Let me, um, let me hit this real quick. So it should really look like this. You see div, sentence, smart blocks in here, sentence, div. That's very clean. Um, now I saw one that I had that I actually probably need to clean up a little bit. Uh, wasn't on this one, I don't think. But anyway, you'll see strong, bold, you know, font this, color this, all, all this stuff after the div gets very confusing for the system to figure out what it's trying to do. So like Shane said, just keep it to a minimum if you can. Yeah, especially as a, if it comes over from Microsoft. I mean, I kid you not, there's hundreds of lines of stylization that comes over from those templates and it, it's, it's near impossible for our system to read it. Um, Caroline asks, for these to work properly as we work through the transaction uh, the TC will need to be consistently updating property details, question mark, as the transaction progresses. So yes, the smart blocks and, and, and merge fields all pull data out of the transaction 
and inject it into the email. So, so yes, really the, the whole concept around using smart blocks and merge fields and all that is so that your TC, you set up a system of emails that are dynamic and change so that whoever's working your transactions doesn't have to remember to do all that because you've already baked it into the conditional logic of your emails. All you really get to is just entering in data. The data then pushes to the emails and the emails will dynamically generate based upon whatever data is inside of your transaction. From personal experience, I mean, you know how you feel at the end of a 12-hour day doing this. You feel like exhausted and you can't think. This takes away a lot of the thinking. Um, you're thinking through the system up front. And yes, it does take some time to work through all these and get these added and figure out what you need. But once you do, it becomes very easy for the transaction coordinator to be field fillers, contact fillers, document downloaders. Those three things trigger the correct information to come in in the right spots. Of course, there's always going to be higher level thinking in here. But if you can minimize it throughout the course of your day where you're only doing two hours of hard work and the rest is coming in and you're just kind of hitting buttons and you already, you already thought through this, um, your job becomes a lot more enjoyable. You can actually take vacations. The whole, the whole premise of this program for me and Shane was we talked to people who were really struggling doing 20, 30 transactions a month, couldn't take a vacation, or if they did take a vacation, their family hated them because they were on their computer the whole time. This enables you to come in. Um, we have some use cases where people are doing their work in half a day instead of a day or two hours instead of a full day. And that's what we really want to see. We want to see you guys be able to take vacations or hire uh, an assistant or a VA or someone to take care of 90% of this transaction for you because you've already thought through the scenarios and set it up correctly. So here's some other ones that I have in here. Um, so this is in one of our repair emails. So did the, you know, did the buyer request um, repairs? Did the seller agree to them? All those certain things. So in lieu of the seller completing repairs, they'll provide you with a and then here's the credit amount that we type into a field. So this comes into a certain email that's going back to the buyer, letting them know that, hey, the seller said no to your repairs, but they're going to provide a $5,000 credit instead. How it knows to put this in is because I have all my fields set up. So let me come over here and actually I'm going to just dive into fields, even though that's not what we're talking about here, because it kind of does have a part to play in this, um, not field templates, I'm sorry. And you'll see I'm a little field heavy because, again, I want my TCs not to have to think. So I have a lot of fields that they just fill in mindlessly and the system takes care of everything else for them. So the seller response received. Um, I'm sorry, I hit the wrong one. So I have these I have these choice fields in here. The buyer elects as follows. What did the buyer elect? They elected for repairs or a credit or a combo. They accepted the premises as is, or they rejected the premises. Based on these three answers, I know what email I need to send out to the other side. If it's a buyer accepted the premises, I'm going to say, hey, congratulations, Mr. Listing Agent, the buyer accepted the premises. Um, we're going to go ahead and order the appraisal. If they rejected it, it's, hey, sorry, Mr. Listing Agent, the house didn't hold up and you know my buyer's not going to move forward with this contract. You should have an escrow cancellation in 48 hours and attach the right documents to this email that is triggering as well. And then this one is buyer asked for repairs or a credit. This is going to say, see attached for my buyer's response to the inspection. And then it's going to attach whatever documents that I need to attach here to inform them that we want repairs, we want a credit, we want repairs and a credit combo, whatever that is. So use these choice fields to your advantage to trigger either a smart block. So this would be the condition that this Smart block will come in if I chose buyer ask for repairs or a credit. A different smart block comes in if I said accept premises. A different smart block comes in if I said reject premises. Or once you get to uh, triggers, if you want to eliminate tasks and go to our upgraded trigger system, now you can automate emails strictly off the answer here. So now I can have a full email jumping out of the system as soon as I select this. So a lot of time savings there. I just wanted to touch on these fields because these fields do have a lot to do with the conditional data. Uh, we just got a. Uh, okay, you go over the contact. Go over uh, the contact loop again and the new line. So adding, yeah, just create a new contact loop from the beginning. Yeah, I'm just gonna show them from. So this is what it should look like at the end. But from the beginning, let's just pretend this top's not here. You're gonna go to Control A, pop open your merge fields. You're gonna go to um, utilities. 
You're going to select contact loop. Here. Now keep in mind to get that panel, you could also click that little blue round icon at the end of the editor. Yeah, this one right here. Sorry. If you click that, see how that reloaded. So this or control S, or I'm sorry, control A for merge fields, control S for smart blocks. There's also a way to get the smart blocks from the menu items on the left-hand side of your page down at the bottom. Uh, smart blocks is one of the choices in there as well. So once I click on, oh, I'm sorry, once I click on contact loop, it's going to copy it. Come over to your blank email. Let's pretend this is blank. And you're going to paste it. Then you just come over and hit return, return, return. Uh, now I want a break line at the end of it. I want a space before it goes to the second one. You're just going to click on this BR. It's going to copy it. I'm going to paste it down here. And now I can start my contact loop. So I want my first name of my attorney. Uh, so let's go here. I'm going to find attorney. And I'm going to go attorney first name or full name or whatever it is. And then you just keep going down and selecting attorney last name. You know, not that that would be right, but um, business email or personal email or here's attorney cell phone. This is on the personal side. I don't think you'd want to give that to them. But um, so you just keep doing that until you're happy with what information is going to come in. At the end of it, it's going to look like. In my case, it's going to look like this. And so now I know that if I have two attorneys, it's going to list the first one's full name, business name, business email, business phone, business cell phone. Then it's going to do a space. And then the second attorney's information is going to come in full name, business name, business email. And that's all going to be under this. This comes in no matter what. Um, and the only way these are coming in is if contact role attorney exists in the property. So if I have an attorney over here, oh, sorry, I must have closed that screen over here, then it's going to pull in uh, to that smart block. Um, do me one favor here. Go ahead and close that panel and then close that pop that pop up and then um like close that whole screen control p um and then go to the global settings uh, yeah let me okay uh global settings sure yep uh okay so when he was making that smart loop um i want you to click on defaults at the bottom of this page here for your global settings you have merge fields so you noticed in his uh his smart loop that just said, you know, attorney cell phone. Well, it's going to be really hard to know that's attorney cell phone unless you either inside of that smart loop type in cell phone colon. But if you set this pre pin phone and cell phone to your merge field, so you can automatically have that information pre pinned if you want that to be set in, in any merge field or any smart block. So uh, I can't remember if this is turned off by default, but just know that like you don't have to put that in there. Uh, you can use this setting to do that for you automatically. Yeah. A lot of people, I think the default is that it's in there because then after we created the program, a couple of people said, you know, I don't really want that in there. So we created this no, so you could turn it off and it would just show up as the phone number. So here's a final walkthrough one that might come in if they want to rehire their inspector. Um, you rehire your inspector to reinspect the repair items to make sure they've been completed, or you can check the repairs yourself if you choose to rehire, blah, blah, blah. And it gives this. And then here is the actual homeowner, not the recommended by agent, but now they've already chosen the home inspector. They've done the inspection on the house, and that person is going to be in your contacts list as inspector, not inspector recommended by agent. And that person's name is going to pop in here so they don't have to go look it up again. The only way that this is going to come in is if or this whole block is going to come in if the homeowner uh, exists in the property. So that's why it's a smart block, because maybe they chose not to have one. Maybe it was a cash deal. But now you can create emails that will cover cash deals and finance deals at the same time or whatever. You're not having to create 5,000 template emails. Now, maybe you only have 50 that kind of encompass everything with these smart blocks in them. I'm just going to scroll through these two so you get some ideas from maybe I won't go into everyone, but you can at least get some ideas of what I've created and it may or may not make sense, but it may give you some ideas. Uh, contingent sale people. That's always a good one. HOA demand fees. Here's how we do. We do the dues and we do the frequency. So it might say hundred dollars quarterly, you know, $500 yearly or whatever. We're paid by who, paid by the seller, paid by the buyer. 
Um, so you can get pretty detailed with these. If homeowners association is equal to yes and the demand is not blank, then go ahead and pop this in. Those of you without HOAs, you're lucky. And uh, let me get down here. See if there's any other interesting ones that are a little bit outside the box. You can do documentation received too. Um, if you've received, you, now you would have to have correlating fields for some of this stuff. Now, what's going to happen is you're going to be going through your emails and you're going to say, oh, you know, it'd be nice if I could put this smart block in here. Um, but you don't really have a good condition for it. Well, you may have to add an extra field for that condition, like a yes or no field, um, you know, whatever it may be. So this one, let me see what I have for this one. Um, and you can see this one comes in green. So you can stylize this stuff. You just don't go overboard with it. Uh, septic additional documents one received from seller. This is uh, one of my fields. If it's not blank, then it'll go ahead and pop this in. Uh, somebody said, is there a way to sort contacts? Yeah, you just drag the handle to move it in around. And, and also on this, you can expand or collapse. So I like to collapse them. If I'm not, like, obviously I want to show you what was going on inside of it. But um, you can collapse these and then just uh, move them back and forth. Yeah, th there's no way to sort them here, but you do have the contact drawer. So go ahead and open up that. Um, Sorry, click the wrong button. Uh, the contact drawer, these will order in the arrangement of how you have your contact role set up under filters. So uh, in Andrew's account, he's got buyers, the first filter, and then so on and so forth. So um, it will just move them like that. But no, there really is no way to sort them other than um, uh, by manually sorting them right now. Here was that property email that I was telling you guys about earlier too. Once you click this, it's going to copy it. And then you can paste this uh, into an email or a smart block or whatever for somebody that, um, or I'm sorry, you don't even need to put it in a smart block. What you need to put in the smart block is the, uh, let me see if I, the property email address. And it's going to go up here and grab this property email address. And you may have an email from the beginning saying, hey, if you want to send me any additional documents, send them to this address. Because what that's going to do is it's going to pull in those documents and it's going to pop them up here as unapproved documents that you can go in and look at. Where did you go to remove cell phone from in front of the, yeah. So that was over in the global settings. So here in global settings, you're gonna to go to defaults. And then the defaults, you got a bunch of different options in here, but this is where it is. So merge fields, if I want it just to show up as the phone number and not the cell phone, business phone, all that, then you can just select no there and that's gonna remove. Uh, Julie, if you don't have access to that, it, you have to go through the organization owner's account. So whoever your admin is has to adjust that. Here's one sheet right here. Uh, we had to condense some of this because we were getting too many options with some of the upgrades that we're doing. Um, so uh, one sheets is over here now. Some of the other APIs that we're going to put in the system will be over here in the future. So you'll have all your choices in one little menu item here. Okay. Oh, hey, did you did you cover the inline option on Smartbox? I did. I did. So just remember, guys, that in the inline is for on that same sentence line. If you want it on a new line, uh, then you're going to turn this off. So yeah, that it's a little confusing for some people on what inline means. It's just on a sentence like we've sent all fully signed documents to your escrow officer. And then my and lender one uh, that I created somewhere in here, I don't know where and lender is, but um, here we'll use this one and co-buyer agent. That one's in line. So this one's coming into an existing sentence. So you want it to be on the same line. Put a notice. Up. Uh, a couple other things that are coming. Uh, Move easy is one of our partners for um, utility setup. Uh, we're going to be installing uh, Move Easy on the system very soon. Um, also, I'm starting um, a new webinar series. Gra go on Facebook. You can see the series um, Mondays and Thursdays, I think, is new agent uh, orientation. Tuesdays and Fridays is for TC workflow migrations. Uh, Wednesday will be our workshop like this, where we go a little deeper into one thing. And then um, every day of the week, we're going to be doing a setup. So we have a 10-part series on setting up your system from scratch. 
And every day we're going to cover something new, organization screen, then contact roles, file roles, fields, then email templates, then task templates, then, you know, whatever. It's going to go through that entire progression so that you can get your account set up really well. Um, I don't know when that's going to start. I, I need to get a little bit of the uh, information put together, but we are going to be starting that probably in the next, uh, definitely in the next month. So, and the setup is, uh, Beth, the setup is every day of the week. So we're going to go through a 10 part series and it will go two weeks, start over two weeks, start over two weeks. So uh, that will be Monday through Friday, every day of the week. So if you miss a, you know, a setup on email templates, you can jump back in in two weeks and see that one that you missed. They're all going to be recorded. They're all going to be in a, a new module that we're installing in the program so that you can go in there and watch them, check them off as you do them keep up with your progress. Um, it's it's going to be great. The one, the number one request we have is for onboarding help. And so we're really going to focus on that in the next three months or so. Yeah. Um, the other thing is we're going to, we're going to look into maybe some pre-built systems. Um, so if you wanted to download a pre-built system that works and then reverse engineer everything from there, we're looking into that. Um, we will be utilizing those banners at Across the top of your screen, I'm sure a lot of people signed up for this webinar through the banner, through the message. Um, we will be using those as well to keep you guys informed of new features coming out or new webinars, things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, and then one of the big updates that's coming out here, I would say within the next 60 days, is a DocuSign integration. So you'll be able to sign documents through here and also have those sent out to um, any signees that you need to. Yep, that will be awesome. And then the other thing, uh, one more thing is there is a strategy video on this email, um, smart blocks and everything. It's a little bit more concise than this webinar. So if you want to go back and watch that, I post it in the chat. I'm going to post it again. So it's there twice. Uh, you can click on that and it'll take you to that 20 minute video. You can actually go to YouTube and watch it in 1.5 times speed. So it'll only take you, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to get through it if you need a refresher on this information. <laughs> 